Hello and welcome to week six of the Atlantic Abolition and Slavery module. This week we will be talking about the importance of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution in transforming the Atlantic world. Uh, we're going to be building on the slave narratives we discussed last week and place them within the important philosophical and social context in which they were taking place. As we saw um, through the three phases of slave narratives, slaves' lives changed drastically and the role of the Enlightenment is crucial in understanding that process. But before we talk about the 18th century Enlightenment, we need to go back to the 17th century, which is really where the philosophical origins of the Enlightenment begin through what is known as the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Now, I've kind of passingly mentioned this at times throughout um, the module, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now. The scientific revolution is important because it challenges the doctrine and dogma of religious theology, which is the most, at that time, was the most important kind of structural institution of Europe. And I've included some of the most important figures who began to promote critical thinking in this time period and really transformed the way that people began to perceive the world around them. So the individual below me, whose head I'm slightly cutting off, is Johannes Kepler. And Kepler observes the stars and the universe. And he comes up with a theory which he describes as celestial Philip, not Phillips, physics. And what he is talking about in celestial physics is how the planetary uh, systems and uh, the motion of planets interact with each other. And this is controversial because the way he says that the universe moves and interacts contradicts Christian theology and the place of the earth in the universe. It is important to note, though, Kepler is incredibly religious and he believes the forces behind the universe and the way that the planets move are um, designed by God. But by even diverting slightly from Christian theology, um, this begins a process throughout the 17th century. And in the 1620s, you have Francis Bacon, who produces Novum Organum. And that's really the beginning of the approach to science of uh, inductive reasoning, creating scientific experiments, changing variables, and seeing the different results, observing um, what happens in these experiments. And this is critical thinking, this is rationality and reason and questioning. Um, existing ideas. And this is built upon by Galileo, who is known as the father of physics and many other um, sciences and um, academic studies. And he really has an emphasis on critical analysis, looking at existing work and questioning it. What mistakes were made? Are the um, conclusions logical? Do they make sense? And what we now know as critical analysis is really shaped by Galileo, who produces chief world systems, which builds on the work of Kepler. So you get this ongoing um, study into the world and the universe and questioning why things work in the way that they do. And um, by the 70s, 1680s, you have Isaac Newton, who is famous for his theory of gravity. So the scientific revolution of the 17th century is all about adopting reason and methodical scientific approaches to the world. And this really lays the foundation for the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, in many ways, is a philosophical extension of the scientific revolution. Um, and a series of high profile authors in Europe begin to apply scientific method, not just to physics, chemistry and biology, but to social structures 
and philosophy and question the way in which society should function. One of the most important early Enlightenment thinkers wasn't even born in the 18th century, but helped to shape the movements that came after him. And that is the English born John Locke, who is known as the father of liberalism. And John Locke is important because he comes up with the theory of social contract. And what social contract is, it's the idea that everyone is born into an unwritten contract with the state of the country they are born into. So I will have born in, been born into a social contract. John Locke would have been. Anyone watching this video would as well. And the idea is when you are born, you give up a number of liberties and freedoms in exchange for protection from the state. So I was, the law does not allow me to kill anyone. And as a result, I am allowed to go about my everyday life. However, if I was to commit a crime, I would be put in prison, separate from society. And Locke begins to question whether or not the rule of absolute monarchs in Europe was working and whether it was a fair contract between citizens and the people ruling them. And obviously, 17th century England is affected by these ideas heavily. Um, you get the civil war that takes place in England where a king is overthrown because Parliament and the people do not believe that it is a constructive relationship. And Locke is interesting because he says that anything that he um, writes that is proved to be untrue after him, burn it. It is all about the progress of thought. And Locke influences many people in the following century. Um, <clears throat> One of the most important of which is Immanuel Kant, who was born in basically modern day Germany. And it is in 1784 he writes the seminal piece, What is Enlightenment? And this is really where we begin to get different definitions for what Enlightenment thought is. One of the most famous sentences Kant writes is that the Enlightenment is essentially man's emergence from his self imposed immaturity. And I've got a few quotes from the What is Enlightenment letter, and I want you to think about what they mean to you. And we'll discuss them in the seminar. What does Kant mean by man's emergence from self-imposed immaturity? What is the immaturity that he refers to? Because that helps shape the French Revolution. And another important figure in the Enlightenment uh, is born in Geneva, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And that's basically modern day Switzerland. And he creates discourses on inequality that exist in society. What happens in the early modern period is as the Protestant revolution happens, the Catholic Church and Protestants are so busy fighting each other that they weaken their own influence on society. And in that gap, absolute monarchs become the dominant force. And Rousseau argues that the kings and monarchs of Europe um, are, are not acting in the best interest of the general population. He writes a famous essay called On Education, which is so controversial that um, it is banned in Paris because he suggests that everyone should be educated. Everyone should be able to read and write and have access to <coughs> scientific literature. Rousseau is interesting as well, because it's not only these scientific and philosophical pieces he writes, he writes romantic literature as well, one of his most famous books being called Julie. And this is where you get the links between kind of romantic ideas of revolution and um, deeply political issues. So you get these philosophers in Germany and England and Switzerland and throughout Europe, but one of the countries that has the, a really strong enlightenment movement is in France. And one of the most important figures in the French enlightenment is Francois-Marie Arrou, otherwise known as Voltaire. And Voltaire as a young man writes um, provocative and satirical pieces about the kings 
of France, um, suggesting that the king at the time had an incestuous relationship with his daughter. Um, and he's put in the Bastille prison for a while and is eventually um, exiled to England. And it is in England where he reads about the science of Francis Bacon and um, the other figures of the scientific revolution. And he also reads Shakespeare and he begins to write himself. And he writes letters that are sent throughout Europe. Um, and what we get in this time period is an explosion of literature, um, of pamphlets and books that are being passed throughout Europe, all exploring criticisms of monarchs and the rights of citizens of their countries. And France gets such a strong Enlightenment movement because their monarch in the second half of the 18th century is so ineffective. Um, what you get in France is a series of crises as these Enlightenment thoughts are moving throughout the Atlantic world. So it's not just the Enlightenment that causes a revolution in France, it is other factors as well. I've mentioned the Seven Years' War between Britain and France for um, over different parts of the Atlantic and North America. That has a heavy toll on France. Um, they are constantly involved in war for the slave trade and different routes in the Atlantic. As a result of the Seven Years' War, France essentially goes bankrupt, which leads to high taxation on peasants specifically. There is also the unfortunate timing of a bad series of harvests, which means people are starving, uh, being given higher taxes. And Louis XVI's own behaviour is important and his own lifestyle. He's one of the most decadent monarchs the world has ever seen. He lives in the Palace of Versailles. He has notoriously has these big parties, spends huge amounts of money. I've included a portrait of him on the right of this so you can see his clothing as well. So as his country is struggling under taxation because of his wars, starving because of bad harvests, they are also reading all these ideas from the Enlightenment. And there is a reaction, a very quick reaction in these seven, late 1780s, early 1790s against the way that Louis is behaving. And Louis, essentially, the power dynamic in France changes. He runs out of money and he has to call a national assembly, which is known as the estate generals. And that's between the three main parts of French society, the clergy, clergy the nobles and the common people. And Louis is essentially asking for their help. And the conversation between the different groups breaks down and all out rebellion breaks out. And contrary to the enlightened philosophy of uh, Rousseau and um, Locke and Voltaire, the actual reality of overthrowing institutionalized systems of government is the polar opposite. The French Revolution is characterized by extreme and widespread violence opposed to uh, rationale and reality. So. The, you get these famous examples of the Women's March on Versailles, the storming of the Bastille, the September massacres, all of which I'll go into more detail um, in the seminar. But essentially what happens is Louis is overthrown and the country struggles to produce um, a new system of government to replace him. You have the extremists in the Jacobins who can't control the country and decide to execute anyone who opposes them. They fail, other groups emerge, and essentially France is in a state of civil war throughout the 1790s as these Enlightenment movement ideas translate into brutal reality. And um, in the period 1793 to 94, you get 40,000 people die alone. So it is incredibly violent. And it's all really centered on the idea of the rights of man 
and Citizen, which is written by different people throughout the Atlantic world, two of the most famous of which, Thomas Jefferson and General Lafayette. So it is a mixture of American and French philosophy that has been inspired by Rousseau. And the basic principle, although there are 17 points in it, is that all individuals are born equal and everyone should have universal rights. Um, but the problem is people disagree about how those rights should be implemented and inevitably some people end up with more rights than others. I've included some of the articles from the declaration on this page and if you could have a read through them I'm going to ask you about them in more detail in the seminar. But essentially these ideas, as noble as they are, are not translated into reality. One of the most famous examples of this is to do with gender. And in retrospect, many historians believe that the French Revolution was not so much about class, but almost a gender. It was about male, male rights. Because what you get afterwards, um, a, um, a satirist and philosopher called Olympe de Gaulle, um, produces the Declaration of the Rights of Women and of the female citizen, which is essentially the same, but every time man, uh, the word man has been written in the declaration, it is replaced by woman. And this is to highlight how the French Revolution does not translate into women's rights. And what happens as a result of this is um, de Gaulle is executed for her radical ideas. So the Enlightenment is not being translated into all members of society. And the French Revolution is interesting because it stems as a result of these Enlightenment ideas, but very little, in some ways a lot changes and in other ways very little changes. I've included the three leader, the major three leaders of France in this time period. So beneath me on the left of your screen you have King Louis the 16th, the decadent old monarch who is executed who is replaced by left-wing extremist in uh, Robespierre, who cannot control the spiralling violence of the country and begins a reign of terror, terror and kills everyone. So one absolutist is in many ways replaced by another absolutist. He becomes incredibly unpopular as time goes on, gains too many political enemies and is killed. And in that vacuum, you get the rise of Napoleon, who, for want of a better term, is a military dictator and again, an absolutist. So France, despite all these ideas, never really replaces um, a tyrannical leader with anything else. In theory, there is a constitution, but it does not translate into reality. But... The in friends in France have ripples across the entire Atlantic world. Um, the old regime in France was one of the oldest and strongest monarchies. And to see it lose its influence and power and be replaced um, gives inspiration to people who do not agree with their own leaders. And following 1789 French Revolution, there is a series of revolutions that happens rapidly throughout the Atlantic world. So many in Europe, in modern day Holland and Belgium, you get them in Ireland and Scotland, throughout Latin and South America, um, and of course, Haiti, which is the most relevant to our course. And we'll be talking about Haiti in detail next week and the, the relationship the Haitian revolution has with the French Revolution, the French, of course, being their colonial overlords. So the main points from this uh, lecture I've left on this slide for you to look at, you can just pause it and make notes. Um, but for the seminar, I want you to read Laurent Dubois' An Enslaved Enlightenment, Rethinking the Intellectual History of the French Atlantic. And that's a really interesting article about the origins of the French Revolution and the role of enlightened thought. It's only 14 pages, it won't take long. And then I want you to think about the three following questions. 
One, what was the origins of the French Revolution? Two, what is the relationship between the Enlightenment and the French Revolution? And three, what was the impact of the French Revolution on the rest of the world and slavery specifically? So think about those questions, read the article, and I'll speak to you uh, next week in seminar. Thank you.